My name is Stephen Hamilton. I'm a multimedia artist, educator, and researcher. I think in terms of like where I am right now as a maker, I think about um, my background as an illustrator and also um, my opportunity to live in Nigeria um, and study at the Nikkei Center for Art and Culture um, in Oshobo, Gidi, Jumu, and uh, Lagos. And I had the opportunity to live in Nigeria for nine months. And it was there that I learned traditional weaving, uh, indigo dyeing, um, wood carving. Um, I was learning more about traditional Yoruba religion in the West African context. When I think about reclamation that has, um, it manifests itself in a lot of different ways in the work. So one is with the material. So I work a lot with indigo and I work a lot with cotton. Um, so these are two um, industries that were important industries not only in the United States, but also throughout the Caribbean and South America. In many cases, um, it was dependent on the labor of enslaved Africans. You know, when thinking about uh, working with these materials, um, I'm also thinking about like that knowledge. I'm thinking about um, the cultural associations um, that have that we have with those materials now, and also the historical um, associations with those materials in pre-colonial Africa. This pattern in Yoruba is called um, elelo, or oshupa. Oshupa means uh, moon. Um, and it's made by basically just gathering the fabric like this, and then tying it, wrapping it up, and then tying it. So this technique is called adire, or adire. Um, and that literally just means to tie and dye. Adi means to tie, ire means to color or dye. I mean, the dye typically used to make um, adire is indigo. Uh, so you see like an example here of um, indigo on this like heavy uh, cotton fabric. Here I'm using cam wood. So as an artist who uses these materials, as an artist who is a weaver, as an artist who makes these things, who makes these cloths, um, it's important to think about that as an act of reclamation. Like this was a very common um, art form throughout Southern Nigeria, which was uh, the place of origin for a lot of us in the diaspora. So um, that part of the work, that part of literally sitting at the loom, that part of working with indigo, that part of um, incorporating these materials is um, very important in reclaiming that art form as an African-American. And I think um, with the Founders Project and other pieces, um, other public art projects that I've done before, where I was actually teaching young people, um, specifically young uh, black and brown people, how to weave using this loom, teaching them about adire, teaching them about um, indigo dyeing, that also is an act of reclamation because I'm able to teach that to another generation of people. One of the things about like the work that I do is it's exploring pre-colonial African artwork, but I also have to honor the fact that I am an African-American, which is a, a unique experience. I'm a diasporic African. Um, and what that means is the way that I perceive, you know, my blackness and I perceive my um, Africanness is unique to me as an individual, but it's also um, through the lens of somebody who is descended from enslaved people. You know, I think about like my identity as an African-American and I think about my identity as a diasporic African, and I think about like what are the connections that exist between those, um, and what does it look like um, as we move forward to bring that into, bring that back into, um, you know, how we think about ourselves. I think as an artist who's a black person, as an artist who creates work for black people, it's important that um, people have agency in how they're represented, people have agency um, in how they're depicted, and people, feel like empowered through the experience of, you know, sitting and being photographed, um, sitting and being painted. Well, this work that is almost done, it's called um, Onishango. So uh, that piece started off um, with, uh, you know, the models like coming in and modeling for me. So one of the models is uh, Sean Phillip. He's um, a model from Boston. Um, he also worked for um, Artists for Humanity um, doing like videography work. Um, amazingly talented model. And the other figure is my cousin, who's, you know, my cousin, <laughs> who's like, uh, I'm really, really close to, is also a very creative person, as a writer. You know, sort of working with my cousin, Stacey S. Hamilton. So there's like a lot of labor that happens, but it all sort of happens simultaneously. So, you know, as I'm, you know, working uh, with um, the photographer, I'm also, you know, weaving, I'm also drawing, I'm also like sewing, I'm also doing all of these things. So, 
you know, all together, if we think about the labor, it takes like a year to make one of the pieces, but I'm working on all of these pieces simultaneously. So they all sort of finish around the same time. There's also um, an importance for the people who are painted um, you know, in this work, the people who are the subjects of the work, for them to feel like there's some agency in how they're represented. I think a lot of times when we think of um, contemporary images of black people, you know, we become dissociated from our bodies in ways um, that are very violent. You know, we don't really have as much agency over our image. I incorporate birds a lot in the work um, because there's something really fascinating about birds. When I was young, I was really into birds. <laughs> like, I really like loved birds when I was younger. Um, but there's also something really important about bird imagery and flying imagery in African folklore. So thinking about birds as sort of symbolic of these um, very potent spiritual forces that can be beneficial or destructive, but also thinking about the magic of birds. So like, and this idea that birds, you know, they have the power to speak with human voice, you know, they fly, they walk with two legs. So like there's something very magical about that. This ability to like slip the bonds of like gravity. And then also thinking about flying as like an important imagery in African American folklore. Like um, a lot of people talk about like this reoccurring thing in African American folklore and also like African American writers, my favorite writer of all time, uh, Toni Morrison. Like this idea of the flying Africans, like people flying away. So, you know. Uh, the folks in like Ebo's Landing like flying away home and you know in Song of Solomon this imagery of like flying people this idea of people who have like the power to fly and I think that that's such magical imagery and I'm thinking about like what are the origins of those images what are the origins of those um, stories you know how does that like relate um, to these other elements in uh, African spirituality philosophy um, and folklore um, so they become like an important part of the work in that way. This is sort of like assisting in the moment that we're in. Um, what I'm hoping happens is that um, people are seeing the work and they feel inspired, or people see the work um, and they see themselves in the work. You know, so in, in that way, like I, I hope that the work doesn't function differently than um, I hope that it functioned before the pandemic started. You know, I, I think about um, the work as um, sort of like how I view the world, how I build out the world. But I really think about the people that I paint and I think about the community that I paint and I hope that they're able to see themselves in the work and feel empowered by it. I think the way that I, I've been trying to take care of myself is um, to like make time for just doing whatever like is on my spirit to do. If I feel like weaving and I have that time, I'm weaving. If I feel like drawing, giving myself to draw. If I feel like playing video games, <laughs> playing video games, like just like listening to, you know, what I need to do in the moment and like really trying to take away from like, like this pressure is like, I need to be doing this. I need to be doing that. Like how much of this stuff do I really need to be doing? What is it that I actually have to do? And what am I telling myself I have to do? Because like it is, I've, you know, internalize this idea that they're sinful. It's sinful to have like time where you're not doing anything. I mean, my thing is like how, whatever that looks like for you is what that looks like for you. You know, I think um, there's so much around like this, this, these ideas about what people should be doing. It's like, oh, you should be, you know, writing a book or you should be doing nothing. Whatever taking care of yourself looks like for you, that's what you should do. And sometimes, like, the difficult part is, like, figuring out what it looks like to take care of yourself. <laughs> because a lot of us don't know what that looks like. We've never really had to, like, think about that. Figuring out what does it look like to begin to learn how to take care of yourself. <laughs>